the recruited to the this bridge, location and got established. So thank you, Les. Meters, bearing two, two, five degrees. Les is calling from the University of Hawaii uh, Marine Biology of the Biology Program. Range, and three, zero there's a Chrysogorgia, I think. Five, Maybe we speed, can take a zero, quick zoom two. at the one in the that's center. Coming out of the middle now? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, video, come on in. And then when we finish there, these stick-like things, I think I know what they are in the background on the boulder, but that's going to be new. Yeah. Partial. Trying to move toward it, right? Yeah. Okay, to zoom further. Sure. Uh, it's got a little spot lot sure steady, can keep it. Oh, it's in the genus Europticus. Are we now bridge? Moving issue. Yeah, I guess so. Copy bridge. Uh, why don't you come out Coming and I'll out. try to sit down. There's a barnacle and some other interesting stuff there. All right, let's try that. Roger. Okay, oh. I'll go for a little more. Okay, go. That's holding. So, um, it's just looking down at the event log and let's see if you have some comments. So, Les Watling calls it a nice one third left brancher. So, he thinks we may have seen it before and I. I think he's referring to the direction in which the branches are coming off of the main stem, uh, the direction in which they're spiraling and coming off. And I also think what he means by that is there are, are three branches um, that I guess would be about 120 degrees separated, so they complete a full circle around the stem uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, well, you you have a th full circle every three branches. That makes sense. 120 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Can we all come out for a wider shot? Okay. Establishing. Uh, let me try then, to get lasers. Uh, uh, Chris, I could give a little bit of an explanation of that uh, branching pattern. Um, when you look at the stem, if you pick like Video some branch okay. that's noticeable, oh, say one of the ones to sticking out to the right, then you look spots. to see oh, where the those, next uh, branch like above yeah, it originates. Right. And on this one, you have to make it turn turf. to the left, you kind of go to the left as if you're going clockwise around the stem, okay. Video and you'll see another branch sticking out, and then you keep going in that same direction, and you get another yeah. branch sticking out, and then you go around a little bit more, and you get a branch that's in fact then the third branch above the one you started with. And so that's what you look for. Well, How so many branches and in what direction does it turn? Do you have to go in order to make the turn? And, uh, and so in this particular case, it makes one complete revolution with three branches. So that's why we call it a one, three to the left. Sometimes, uh, in the, some more complicated chrysogorges, it takes two turns and maybe five branches okay. to make to, to get a branch exactly above oh, the one you started with. And uh, and so those branching patterns um, seem to be distributed okay, around the world you, so in slightly different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Northwest Atlantic and the uh, Central that, uh, and Southwest Pacific. Yeah. 
are have very typically the one three west okay, branching yeah, yeah, pattern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you go to other parts of the world, you get two five or one four to the right, and you know, various other kinds of patterns. But very distinct pattern in this part of the world, and oh, I don't know, maybe seven or eight different species have that same uh, pattern. So to, to find out what species it is, species it is, then you need to do some more detailed work looking at uh, the little sclerites that are in the polyp body, but also looking at the distances. In that particular one, we were looking at the uh, distance between the branches was quite large, and that's fairly unusual um, as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Les. And that's the voice of Les Watling calling in from the University of Hawaii. And I really appreciate it. And that also gives you an idea of what sure. uh, the okay. real experts in some of these corals need to look at in order to differentiate them from video. And it's one thing to have a specimen for genetics or for morphological um, examination of their sclerites, their microscopic parts, but it's another game altogether when you're trying to do it from video. So that was a very good explanation of what he is looking for to even get close on the uh, on the ID. So thanks very much again. So pilot, there's some of these white uh, stick-like things that are coming up. Uh, we missed them on that other boulder here while Les was talking, but uh, we'll keep an eye out. They look like toothbrushes that are sticking up, and we can okay. just... Okay, uh, we were zooming in something after that coral. Was that not the right... Uh, no, that was... It was on the that, boulder that behind it, okay. and I wasn't going to interrupt him or sure. anything. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, just point it out next time you see it, and uh, we'll get a zoom. Yep, we will do. Video coming on this. I thing don't sure thing. think it's anything interesting, but... You never know. Uh, looks like it's just uh, it's some debris, fiber or something. All right, thank you. I'll try not to get it stuck, so I don't have to clean it off later, and we're good. <laughs> barren patch here. It's a little flatter, a little more sedimented, sedimented, I mean. Probably so I don't know, Chris, if you want to take another <laughs> break, we'd probably see another sea star. <laughs> if yeah, you yeah. Want, but, uh, I was just thinking that. Should be pretty, pretty close. Well, I'll tell you, if you're not going to take a break, I'm going to step out for five minutes and I'll be right back. <laughs> So I see a lot of little white, uh, what what we're looking for, right? Uh, I think those are these mysterious little critters that we've been seeing all along. Maybe they're uh, forams or bryozoans. I think he's looking, the things Chris was looking for were uh, sort of like toothbrushes. Okay. There's a uh, really tall whip right ahead of us. 
Oh, and what's this? Is that a brittle star? On I think it's brittle mm -hmm. star feeding on something. Well, let's take a look at that. I thought she might be interested. <laughs> the whip can wait. What do you think, a 220 still? Or 225 still? Yeah, 225. And anything I in think that it's, range looks yeah, fine. Yeah, right. 225. To Bridge, go ahead. Hey, are we done that ship move? Uh, yes, uh, sorry about that. We had a, an emergency report come in. No problem. Um, yes, the move has been completed. Okay, no problem. Uh, let's do another one. The same uh, values, range 30 meters, 225 degrees, 0.2. Video, come on in. Aha. 30 Not meters, a bearing a 65 degrees, 0.2 oh. knots. So, okay. this is in. one of mine. Uh, this is Let's a. Kill uh, lasers. Uh, Brasingid sea star. Ones. These are sea stars which are filter feeders. Lasers off. And uh, unlike most sea stars, which are um, to uh, bottom video, let's come a little bit feeders, the whole thing and then we can they hold start their arms up details. into the water and they use those <laughs> spines as sort of a, a filter to capture food. They're covered you with a, like. uh, a layer of um, uh, of tissue that is uh, infested with kind of a invested, I should say, with small claws, which I've previously called kind of like a death Velcro. And what they do is, as uh, prey comes along, little crustaceans, they get caught in the Already little now, claws. Moving and, uh, brought, and after they're caught, the uh, stars bring the uh, food from caught in the spines to the mouth. Um, this one's really nice because we're seeing the tube feet. Uh, it looks like it's... Uh, uh, is that full? Perched on this Not dead quite. sponge, okay. or uh, whatever That's the stock is, and um, uh, it looks like the arms are kind of withdrawn. It might even be possible that it. it uh, most people have uh, assumed that these are filter feeders entirely, but uh, it's possible that they also uh, sort of Look occasionally, opportunistically feed on bottom faunas. Maybe these forams. It's not clear, but so so what this very Thank nice. Zoom is showing us is all of these spines, all of these filter feeding spines, as well as the um, the uh, skeletal armature that makes up the arms. Uh, these are different from other sea stars because they're filter feeders. Their arm structure, sort of the equivalent of our bones, are physically different. They're more hourglass shaped rather okay, than sort of more okay. wing shaped. And so uh, this one is. Uh, one, two, three. This one might be in the genus Phreastera, uh, which is a um, uh, one of the deeper occurring groups. Thank you. We can move on. All right. <laughs> now, to paraphrase uh, Indiana Jones, you give me the star, I give you the whip. So we're coming up on a bamboo coral, which, uh, like many of the corals we're seeing today, is an octocoral. That is that uh, they're going to have eight feeding arms around a central mouth on each of the little feeding polyps that we'll see as soon as we zoom in on it. They're called bamboo corals because oh, the skeleton you can that, come in. Uh, that, that is underneath the tissue is white with, uh, white with rather dark bands, giving it a bamboo-like appearance. Uh, so to our shoreside yep. folks, let's Video, walk on as well. Something has happened to the top of this colony, Chris. It's uh, clearly I'm gonna float uh, up growing differently from lower down. And these Roger. may be different um, bamboo corals than we've seen previously on the dive. So maybe we're getting to our first of the uh, C1 clade whips. Right, so this is a different octocoral, or rather a different bamboo coral than what we've been seeing so far. So that's that's interesting. Um, Scott, uh, so yeah, so what is so? Did you say that there's something going on with the top here, with this less dense number yeah, of polyps? Yeah, it looks like it's we'll much more sparse. Yeah. Um, you can see the polyps right, are really yeah, quite dense, really dense really lower down. They're it's tall and thin, um, with respect to so the diameter of the axis. Cool. And then on that awesome. upper part. You see that they are not quite as dense. Come back down to um, I don't know if this is a spurt of regrowth. Um, one of the things that we have seen in the past is that it appears when you have injury to the colony, um, after it regrows, it starts to grow in a slightly different manner. 
Uh, also, yeah, I noticed. What the yeah. Is. Are, are, and so these are the spicules, right, that we're seeing in the in the tissue. Absolutely. We're seeing the uh, calcium carbonate spicules through the tissue. It catches the light just right, and you can see it. So you see how thick it is in there at that transition spot. So like we saw earlier, there was a bamboo coral colony where you could clearly see it had overgrown something, and I, I suspect something similar went on there. Um, so I'm going to stick to that first hypothesis that um, there was some injury, maybe it was predation, but something Can happened at the top of the yeah, colony, maybe something settled on the exposed oh, skeleton, the and then the tissue of the still living colony overgrew whatever was there and then has continued to grow upwards, and that's why it looks different from the lower part of the skeleton compared to the upper part. Uh, thank you for the close-up. Thank you. Do you uh, did you give, uh, what, did you have a name for this by any chance? <laughs> I, I didn't. We would I mean, right now formally. It's the genus Lepidisis, and I'm equivocating a bit on uh, what clay that is. Wait and see if uh, Les has a comment on what clay this might be. But it's probably B or C. Ah, uh, okay. So Lepidisis. But. But uh, yeah, unsure you, you which one. Name lepidisis and be completely nice accurate right now. Oh, okay. I see. There's actually another exposed part um, near, closer to the tip of the colony. Okay, uh, we can gap try to get that for him. Um, watch. Did you want me to try to get that other uh, gap without polyps? Oh. The cause of difficulty on the top of that colony, I would say, it is not one of your sea stars because that, that would have started much. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let's let's zoom in on that real quickly. Okay. Thank so you. Sure you. So we're going to zoom in on the bare spot there. Okay, I'm trying oh, to stabilize, but you can come in. Copy bridge. Okay, Palace, that move is complete. All right. Now, Chris, on um, some of the uh, dives earlier this year, we were making the observation that. Hello? Scott, you're fading in and out of there. I have said it. Scott? Yeah, I. I All right, uh, video, oh. let's just. No, let's, Roger. Uh, I Thank gotta you. Keep moving Wait anyways. I'm sorry, Scott, we lost you there. Oh, um, I was saying that uh, on earlier dives, okay. uh, we had seen crinoids sitting up on, on corals, and where the cirri, right. the legs of the crinoids, were wrapped around, it seemed to be irritating or abrading uh, off some of the tissue. And I wonder if that's what happened there, that maybe one of the comatulid crinoids had uh, grabbed on, the feather stars there had grabbed on, caused uh, an abrasion of tissue, causing the polyps to be lost, and then it's regrown, and that's why it looks bare. Mm. It is interesting that we didn't see anything um, around there, but uh, it makes me wonder if it's one of those, uh, like you said, chicken, of the chicken or the egg things, uh, whether the crinoid latched there or fish. if it latched there and now it's gone. Oh, Chris, we have a fish. Looks like a chimera. A grenadier, rather. Excuse me. You can go All right, I arrived right on time here. Okay, so let's see if we got any uh, fish people in the event log here, because if not, I'll take a stab at this. I yeah, beyond see. grenadier, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, so this looks like it's a uh, oh. grenadier oh, rat back. tail in the family Macroidae, and Roger. we've been calling this particular species. Um, we think it's in the genus Kumba, K-U-M-B-A. And uh, without actually collecting the fish, it's very difficult to say. But numerous uh, fish, deepwater fish biologists have looked at the Okeanos imagery of this fish over the last two years, and that's their consensus. Um, every I'm once in a while, these fish pose, and that's really nice. <laughs> this one's giving them a good look. I'm not sure if uh, the these fish are, are eaten in this area, but at one time I think there was actually a market for them. Uh, and that's why they, they used to be called colloquially as rat-tailed fishes, 
and for some reason, grenadier sells much better than buying a rat-tailed <laughs> fish at the market. So that's why they're called that, apparently. Uh, too much light in the background. Yeah, yeah rat right. tail may face. not be a good marketing <laughs> name. <laughs> anyway, All thank right, you. Let's let that go. Okay. Doesn't want to go. Centering up. That was, by the way, I think our our first sort of uh, direct observation of a fish on this dive. There's a nice uh, another uh, Derritogorgia on the top of that rock there. Just noting that I think we can move on. And we have found the slope again. Well, beautiful. You're muted, uh, co-pilot. Looks yeah. like there's something up on that big white upper yep. cliff there. Oh, yeah, I see that. Too. Yeah. We'll get uh, with this first, then we'll go over ah. the These look like the glass sponge Walteria. Similar to the ones that we've seen earlier today. Interesting, interesting shape to this one in the foreground. Oh, wow, yeah. It's like it's changed about the direction it wants to grow a few times. Yeah, I think uh, then we have this big... Uh, Catcher's mitt looking thing. Look at, look at the rock there. It looks like yeah, there's uh, a there. different layer, almost yeah. a columnar layer. Some kind of uh, intrusion. Like rock. Huh. Okay. Stepped out again for a few minutes. And of Sorry course, a sponge shows up, a big one. Yeah, this it's like is a, a thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, another variety of the polyopagon. I knew it, polyopagon. Yep, I like that name. It kind of, it's a pretty, pretty interesting name. Now, Walteria sponge on the left there, that kind of tubular thing with the little frills coming off of it. So, two different types of glass sponges. Now going further than the genus Polyopagon is, Polyopagon is a little bit difficult, so we're going to leave it at that. But uh, right now, um, did a little bit of work with Henry Ricewig up in Vancouver on this group uh, a number of years ago, and there's probably at least oh maybe seven or eight species in Hawaii alone that we that we uncovered back then, and I think there's even more now. Uh, these are undescribed species so far. Do you want any details on that? Uh, no, I'm okay. fine, thanks. Won't help. <laughs> <laughs> Even looking at the specimens, they're a hard group. Now, uh, how are we doing on that move? It's likely about done. Let's see. Okay, great. There has got to be a sea star in amongst this terrain. It's hard to see because USBL is actually tracking pretty well. <laughs> well, if, it's, uh, <laughs> if our indications from the last few expeditions are any evidence they're probably inside those sponges inside feeding <laughs> well that could be i think we, well i we, mean uh, you know if you ever want to take a closer look at one of the sponges well. to look for sea stars just chime in <laughs> even if i identify it that uh, anything in that range yeah. is fine that's all uphill yeah we can proceed uphill chris we actually did get a sea star i think while you were out it was on uh <laughs> rub it, it was in on a, a dead sponge Oh, another one, I mean. 
Oh, another. Oh, right. another one. Right. Uh, we have a, I'm losing track of who's here and when, but we've three, seen we've seen two good two, ones. Two, five degrees, zero two. Decimal two. Well, there was that earlier one, that Slime Star, that and then right. there was uh, a white three, one. Zero. So you're saying Chris while was I here was out, there was three. another one. Uh, no, you were you were here. Oh, Sorry, okay. that that uh, orange right. uh, one with the what? long spines. It was up on a dead Oh yeah, sponge. sure, the Brasingid. Yes. Three. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There was a Brasingid. Yeah, oh, it's a okay. Freastra or something. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. It would happen while you were out, just before we got to the uh, long whip coral. Okay, Dave. Over on this. No, I'm sorry. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm still looking for these toothbrush sponges. Oh, right. But I don't think Is those are. Uh, no. I don't think so. Okay. Those are dead stocks. We could do a snap zone, but I. I could get a little closer. I'm sorry, guys. We just passed a fan that was um, kind of thin. It was a it was a Arby fan. Bridge, it was a bit wiry, and I'm just wondering, kind of a bridge. young version of some of the uh, bamboo corals we saw earlier, or if it's something new. So next time we come across one, if you could have just a quick look at it. Okay. Actually, have he's, a minute. He's um, backing up a little bit, Scott. I think this it. one here, Dave, is what he's talking about. I think so too. Yeah, Scotty, we're able to relocate that colony, so we're going to zoom it right now. Great, terrific. Thanks, Dave. Yep, that's the one I'm referring to. We've passed a couple of them. I just want to be sure that uh, come on in, um, I'm not being thrown off by the overall this. scale. Uh, this might be the Isodella again, but I just want to have a close look and make sure. And uh, let's turn lasers on. I think we have them off right now. Okay, you can come in tight if you like. Uh, moving all over the place. Yeah, I mean, this this looks kind of like the Isodella. I'm just not sure the branches are quite as angular as early, but I can already see that it's uh, branching from the nodes. And that's, uh, or just above the nodes. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, I think it is the nodes, and some of the branches are tucked behind, so maybe they look like they're internodal. Uh, so we will chalk this up to another Isodella. Thank well, you for that view. Yeah, thank you, Pilot. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Um, Dave, there might be some... There might be some of these toothbrush sponges on that boulder straight ahead. Okay. I don't know, but there could be. We'll give it a shot. That was the direction you're going, hopefully. Yeah, more or less. Yeah. We're going up. Yeah. Any, anything <laughs> up is, uh, is yeah. helpful. Th this, is, this is what I was looking for. Great. So you can... We zoom on that little patch. This is great. And I know what this is, but it's good to document it anyway. It's the first time, well, we're noting a very different type of a sponge here. And, yes, these are sponges, I believe. Okay, come in on those sponges. Yep, so uh, these are demo sponges. They're not glass sponges. They're in a different holding? group. And um, well, I'm trying to get back to it. Scott, gotcha. I believe you actually collected uh, some of these back in 2015 when you were in the, this monument. Sorry. And we identified them as... Yep, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Chris, we passed through some areas where the density of these sponges was really quite remarkable. We would see hundreds of them for um, dozens of meters. Yeah, so this is in the genus uh, Pyloderma. You can come in tight. And uh, I believe that identification is coming from either Shirley Pomponi um, or Rob Van Soest, right, who's over in the Netherlands, who's uh, a specialist in one of these sponges. All right, I'm taking a little more zoom. Yeah, and I'm that's in the family Dendrocelidae, for those spongophiles out here. 
very cool little sponge, and I, I call them toothbrush sponges, although I'm not sure they really look like toothbrush, or you'd want to use one for toothbrushes, but... Well, brush yeah. seems good. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a good Sorry. pilot whenever Come video on, is ready. I'm not able to get that. Okay. All right. Did ever finish on that ADCP now? I don't know. I haven't heard so the word otherwise. Pilot, I have one more quick request, if sure. that's possible. You see the left side of this big fan that's uh, directly in front of us where yes, the lasers? Yes, it does look a little different over there. Yeah, I think we've got some zoanthids overgrowing this, so it might be a, worth a quick look. Okay. Okay. Well, sea stars aren't the only things that are, are average, picking on bamboo probably. corals down here. <laughs> I haven't seen a lot of other things, honestly. I mean, even no sea okay, urchins, very few in. cucumbers, yeah, not even that one? many crinoids, relatively speaking. Yeah, we could do it. All right, so there are no oh, zoanthids wow. here. It's just discolored, I guess. Right. No, it's a hydroid. More a hydroid. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there they Range are. Three zero meters bearing this two, is the same. Two, I, I don't know if they're the same, but zero I've seen something similar like Thank this bridge. covering those sponges as well. Same one. Kay. I think... Uh, Tina called them solandaria. Is that full? I've got full more zoo. Okay, I don't know if I'm <laughs> that's stable full. enough. Wow. Also, is that a spider crab on the uh, left side up there? Uh, oh, I see. It just went off screen, straight center. There he is. Yeah. I think that's what it is. I think that's one of those Galathea spiny long arms or whatever we're calling it. We're seeing the underside of it. Copy that bridge. Move initiated. Copy bridge. Come on out. I need okay. to straighten sure myself out here. Thank you. See, Scott, this is what, uh, I guess, uh, the same sort of thing. You know, what, whatever cleaned those off, I mean, was it maybe a battle with the hydroids, or was it a starfish, or one of those aplacophorins? We don't see the, uh, the cause in place, so it's interesting. Yeah. What are we moving out I, now? Chris, I saw three aplacophorins on Great. that uh, zoom. Um, I have a hard time believing that the apocoprins can clear off that much of the tissue, but I suppose given long enough, it uh, is certainly possible. Oh, you saw uh, apocoprins. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense to me, though. For more right than that. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm right so now, at least. That would start to make sense with the I think uphill uh, back is a little bit. Maybe two, four, five. Okay. Yeah, we'll adjust uh, the next yeah, one. Yeah, the next one's fine. Sorry, Chris, sometimes it's hard to tell when you're talking, and I, I shouldn't be talking over you. Um, I was going to say, I, I have a hard time believing that the April Conference could eat all that tissue, so maybe there was a uh, an asteroid sea star that started like the job, April Conference joined in, but once the skeleton is cleared, oh, then it becomes a substrate for settlement. That's when the hydroids would move in. Oh, yeah, I, I heard that part of it, Scott. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, I agree with you. Um, it'd be nice to think. Uh, that it was a sea star, but I still think uh, slow and steady can win the race. I bet those aplacophorins are more efficient than we give them credit for. That's another uh, left royella sponge there uh, in the distance. And more of these toothbrush demo sponges, pilot derma on the boulder. I think we can get to the boulder. That uh, sponge in the distance is a little too far right now. Yeah, we could skip these guys. You, you okay. got some great shots of them already. Scott, we're definitely getting into a steeper portion along your transect here. I can, I can look over the screens and look at the uh, the fleeter mouse to, or the high pack display in front of the in front of nav. Chris, is this a uh, tripod uh, 
coral, a trident, or is this a black coral that's just got three branches near the top on the left side? Uh, this is oh. this is a coral. this is a black coral. Maybe yeah, that yeah. Trisopathies. Yeah, that's it. I think. Yeah, there's a big left royella vase sponge there in the distance. I'm coming quickly on this uh, black coral. I think it is. Partial. Okay, going further. Well, we got Tina in the event log here, and coupled with Scott, maybe we'll get an idea on this. No, what do we think here? Uh, is this a uh, what is this? Is this Trisopathies? I don't know. It looks a little different. Going back down. I'm sticking with Trisopathies on this one. Okay. Coming out a little bit. Okay. I think it's possible that the polyps uh, toward the center may be packed with um, gametes, which is why they look white. Thank you, Scott. The way for those of you who don't recognize his voice, that's the voice of Scott France uh, calling in for the University of Louisiana. Yet, all right, okay. Tyler, come on out. I need to move ahead. Roger. Yeah. Pull away. It's one of those uh, new genera of bamboo that hasn't been described yet, or hasn't been released yet, or published. It's named the lyrate bamboo. We just passed on the left, and a little shrimp or something in the water column just went by. Let's. Um, this is yeah, thing that we're coming up on that's not moving out of the way. <laughs> Amphipod, I guess. Yeah. yeah. A bunch of big bamboo fans over on the left side there as we're coming up slope. Can uh, these these corals. Um, uh, is that a fish up in the water column? I think it is. Above the ah, fin. Ah, yes, I see it. We'll go for that. Another big sponge over on the right yeah, there. Uh, but we've got to go for the. We got to go for the fish. Fastest moving thing first. <laughs> <laughs> Good policy. Okay, come in. Uh, huh. This one's pretty slow. Huh. For now. <laughs> Once you're done with fish, let me know. Dave, you uh, might have heard that, you know. That move is probably done. Okay. ROV now. Bridge. Bridge. Move complete. There we go. I am Thank totally you, spacing on my fish right now. I know this fish. And I'm going to have to go to the Okeanos Animal Guide, online guide. Probably kill lasers. We just uh, hit it for size. That you can go to two. Yes, it is. Taking a bit more zoom. Okay. So it's going to be in the genus. Uh, I'm going to throw this out. I think it's Basil Gigas, just a superficial look at it. Um, Bruce Mundy, of course, would be able to nail it pretty quickly. So, Cuskiels are the family of Ophidiidae. And uh, one of the things you look at is uh, this particular group has got You already forked, got the lasers on it? Forked, yep, you we, said yeah, we, we, we got it. Yeah, and you could clearly there. see that it was a forked or branched pelvic fin. I have a little more soon, but it's getting pretty far out there. Yeah, yeah. Let's let him go. This guy, um, he's got some bruises on him, so somebody might have tried to go after him for a while, and he rammed into some rocks, or he tried to go after something else. A nice scene in front of us. Yeah. 
Yeah, Especially yeah, that we, big fork thing on the left. I was thinking yeah. we haven't seen that before. Oh, that's Trito Pleura. We could skip that one. But okay. these are these yellow corals or stumps of, I think they're stumps of sponges. Yeah, um, big polyopagon, massive sponges there on the right, those three. Uh, come in on this yellow gotcha. object. I can't really get too close with all this stuff sticking up. So I think you're seeing the remnants of one of those big white ones on the right. What happens to it when it dies and eventually Perfect. decomposes? And that grappling set of basal spicules are clinging to the rock so tightly that they actually persist after the sponge is long gone. They also seem to make good substrate for all those yeah. little tiny okay. foramps or those white branching things, whatever they are. And ophies too. See the ophi oh, yeah. right there? Well, the ophioids might be might have been in there before anyway. You know, mm -hmm. No sense moving out of a good home. But, but uh, I suspect that the uh, whatever the little white branching things are might be a, a new succession or something. So even when they're dead, they, they're home to something. Okay, video is clear. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah so if you followed uh, what I was just saying there, those big sponges in the back there, on the in the back right, those three yellow things on the on the left, they're the remnants of those I'll big white things. Anything else in this grouping we'd like to close up on? No, I don't think so. Just right. Yeah, I think we can okay. move on. Move on. Power right. through the view. It's looking more like 280, yeah, zero, 285, uh, something like that. 280. Two west. Copy that. West, yeah. This is the bridge. Go ahead. Can we do another ship move, please? Yes, sir. Kind of looks from my view like it's going to be picking up there in the distance. Two eight zero yes, it is, three. Scott. Speed zero decimal two. Three zero meters range. Once again, as we get into a little higher bearing terrain zero here. Two knot speed. Go copy. Still kind of bouldery, though. Bouldery and cobbly, but. What was that uh, bearing, Matt? Two eighty. Yes, uh, good observation. Two eight zero. Now yeah. we okay. say yeah. that the uh, bottom has to be stable enough for the coral to be able to grow on it. But a lot of these colonies are quite large, which suggests to me that this is really quite stable, despite the fact that it looks so rubbly. Yeah, and every once in a while, I, I did see one that was um, knocked over. And I don't know if it got knocked over or it just fell over. I didn't see if it was still Probably attached to his rock. But shoot. we have seen elsewhere Thank where the you. coral seems to have outgrown the rock that it settled on. And with enough current coming by, uh, eventually it got pushed over. And they don't do well when they're lying flat on the substrate. So, Scott, have we seen this? Uh, bamboo coral before. This is a Corrado Isis or something, isn't it? With that red coloration? Yes. Um, red coloring is often indicative of the D2 clade, uh, Corrado Isis. And I'm just looking at some of the collections that we made in 2015 to see if I think this is uh, D1 or hey, something in, else. We actually collected it. I'm not sure what... The echnomyces that I'm used to seeing tend to be uh, three-dimensional. This is uh, clearly planar. It's not quite full. I think there are two colonies down there. Okay, I like it like that. You said these two hold fast. Move around a little bit. Yeah, I think this is in the uh, D1 clade. Clearly the internodal branching. Like uh, reddish color that okay, you were referring to. Okay, does it further? Mm -hmm. Sure. Like a couple of places here. I'm not sure what the what the deal is with those little smiles. Maybe there was a branch going to arise there and didn't. Kind of interesting. <laughs> I like that little smiles. It's almost like a, a up, double node or a split node or something weird. Yeah, well, that's what I would expect if a branch had come out from that point. That would be kind of like a, a nodal branch, but mm -hmm. this is not a nodal branch, so I'm not sure what to make of it.
Look at that. Uh, a bunch of them are like that along this main branch. As he's going up, okay, sure that one isn't. But there are three of them in a row like that. Lifting off. Oh, there's another one. Is he smiling or yelling? There's still Can't plenty tell of mysteries to solve about how exactly these bamboo corals grow and, you know, what is the, uh, what is it that precipitates or signals an event for when a branch should arise or not. It's clear that branching can develop on various parts of the colony at different ages. So you can see there are some very small branches that come out of very thick branches, which tells you that it's a very different time period in, in which they grew. And, um, it's interesting to think about what are the characteristics that could uh, precipitate or be a signal to the colony to start forming a branch. Great. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, Scott. So, yeah, we're good whenever video is good. And we'll coming heading up. Nice. And the never-ending search for a starfish. <laughs> Almost kind this of a trek for stars. I'll follow up by saying in 2015, I guess you and Ben um, collected a sample from a Corradoisis on in uh, Papahanaumo, Kuakea, up, uh, let's see, an unnamed seamount east of Pearl and Hermes. Um, yeah, that I looked very I much like this. The problem it looked very interesting as it came from oh, 2,149 yeah. yeah, uh, meters. Ago, you uh, so there's a real depth dependency for some of these well. species. Yeah, Theo, I, you want to come in on this? Yeah, I remember that, Scott, because it was a red one. I'd never seen that red color before. Okay, we're on a shrimp right now. Oh, this is going to be difficult. i got stuff under me. Yeah, boy. All right, get it if you can. That's Max down. Megan Putz in our uh, in our lab okay, group uh, there at the University of Hawaii was it looked up and was educating us on how to differentiate of some of these different that. Nice. shrimps, and now I'm forgetting. All right, so, probably yeah. let that go. There's a couple possibilities there on that shrimp. Nice. If I'm not mistaken. One is Plesiopeneus, and the other is uh, Benthosissimus, if I'm not mistaken. But I'm going to check the online guide right now. So, Scott, um, I'm noticing that several of these bamboo corals are quite large. Um, what might the age of uh, a bamboo coral like this be? Um, for those of you who are watching, there are some uh, yeah, we, that are approaching, I don't know, Scott, would you say yeah, seven feet, I eight feet tall? Yeah, I don't think that would be unusual uh, for us to have uh, them that size. And uh, at least the bamboo corals that have been aged, you know, it's easy to say that they are likely hundreds of years old. Uh, I don't think any today. Yeah, I, I don't believe that there are any bamboo corals that have been aged greater than a thousand years. I think it's on the order um, of 300, 400 years. 300 to 400 years. It doesn't Almost mean they can't grow so to that age. Uh, wow. Based on the data that we have. Uh, that's an estimate for some of the really big ones that have very thick bases. Uh, the problem with answering a question like that is that there's a lot of different species. You know, you've heard us throw out some different names today. We've seen at least, I think, four different uh, genera of bamboo corals today. Uh -huh. And they don't necessarily all have the same metabolism and physiology and growth rates. They may deposit skeletons at different rates. So it's hard to say just from looking at it without knowing what species it is and like something about its growth characteristics. But easily hundreds of years. Right. So... I mean, when you were saying 300 years, this could this could easily have been around in you know before before the beginning of our country. Absolutely, and especially the beginning of my country since I'm Canadian. <laughs> yeah, I think I could add uh, to Scott's comment that I think the oldest bamboo has been aged at around 800 years, and um, and generally. Speaking, I think that might be it for bamboos. Other corals, some of the black corals, in fact, the one one black coral collected off of uh, off Hawaii, uh, the island of Oahu, was 
aged at 4,290 years. So Oof. some uh, corals in the deep sea can live really long times, but uh, oh, yeah. bamboos don't seem to be one that, that uh, as Scott said, Oof, go completely. beyond 1,000 years. The other issue with, uh, that's been discovered with the uh, problem with aging in the bamboo corals is that uh, even when you get the bait, Sometimes what has happened is you have, the reason why you have these big, thick-looking bases is because a second colony uh, has settled on the base of the first colony. On this coral, and, uh, and I think there's one paper uh, by some French workers that showed um, three different colonies basically at the base, starting at the, on the, what looks like the same base. So it can be pretty complicated um, until you get actually inside um, and look at the way the rings are developed and so on in order to find out um, really what's going on. Uh, okay. But still, old. <laughs> yes, we're going to have a... 800 years is nothing to... <laughs> yeah. Come on, NVIDIA. So we're going to have a look at uh, uh, this really nice stand of okay. corals okay. here. These, these are pretty big ones. And then there are some white kind of little bulging areas on some of the branches that I wonder. There's one in the back there. I wonder if we could take a focus on uh, to the right of the lasers, uh, upper right of the lasers, that is. It's like it's some type of a okay. of tumor or something. I'm not really sure what's going on there. Pulls in. So an aberrant growth, because you can see polyps on it. Here's more of these uh, weird tentacular things with the hair coming out of them. Same, different proportions, but... Well, is that is that one of those um, yeah. s skeleton type of amphipods? Or look caprelids? Caprelids, yeah. It doesn't look like a caprelid. No, there's no... Uh, Do we have a ship moving? Uh, a ship stopped, so you probably just finna... Let's see, it stopped uh, uh, two minutes ago, so... Yeah, uh, it's still again. swinging. Something's being overgrown, a uh, parasite, acrothoracic barnacle, um, I don't know what's going on with that curly cue coming mm -hmm. off of uh, in the background there. That's an odd one. Yeah. So much for us to learn okay. down here. Any more? Anything uh, else here? I'm not sure. Watch these. Anything else on this one? You know, we were just take... talking about how old these colonies are. I think we're good, pilot. If okay. they're living for yeah, hundreds yeah. of Come years, on. there's a lot of time for these colonies to respond. Fully. To various insults to the colony, predation or um, abrasion by sea stars or crinoids being on it or uh, fish nibbling at it. And because they're colonial, they're capable of asexual reproduction, um, they can essentially heal those wounds. They can continue to grow even though some parts of the colony may be dead. And so as they regrow over those parts, they may redeposit calcium carbonate, or as Les was just saying, a second individual, another larva, will settle on the original colony and overgrow it, and so also make it um, a little bit hard for us to understand from this viewpoint. Oh, wow. Huh. What it is we're That's weird. Okay, thank you. Interesting. So although an animal, very similar in some ways to some plants, they just kind of grow over things. Yeah, do you know what the plan was to go next? Or are we just kind of exploring right here? Uh, they were following the local highs. Um, so, Josh, we're going to... Oh, it isn't Josh. Who's it? Who's it? It's uh, Andy. Andy. Okay. Yeah, we got a new crew. You guys want to introduce yourselves? Sure. We can uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, pilot right now is Andy Lister, and I'll let my nav go ahead and introduce himself. Uh, Levi Unima, City Nav. This is Josh Carlson, our co-pilot. Tara Smithy on video. Bob, do you want to introduce yourself? Okay, Andy. Um, okay. I got... Uh, and we've got video. Bob on video. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> and uh, we're all with the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration. So what we're doing, Andy, right is... Um, I think it's the first time so you've been on today. Uh, we to the left, imaged most think, everything in view. Um, so we're just keeping our eye out for different things and looking at requests in the event log. Uh, I missed the few just then, uh, earlier on, but I'll keep a better eye on it. And then trying to make it up slope toward uh, waypoint two, 
and that's kind of it. And if we'll give you hopefully a good enough heads up when we see something different. Copy that. So now are we not even seeing anything on sonar up here. Yeah, they were going 280. Um, I think you guys might be at a local high. I would guess. Okay. Um, take a look towards uh, 220, maybe. Okay. Spin back over there. I got uphill on high pack uh, about <laughs> 215. Scott said the midwater folks are amassing their. You're making him uh, nervous, so I guess. Uh, Back here into the excuse center. me, Nav. When you get a chance, we can get an update on how much further we got to go and how much time we've got before we got a break for the midwater dives or the midwater transects. I mean. So, got about 55 minutes left on bottom. 55 minutes. This is an and uphill this can way. We get an update on the position of waypoint. Looks two. like that's where we came from. Waypoint yeah. two. This is uphill. Oh, okay. And I see something on sonar now. Right. And I'm right below you. ROV to waypoint two is 360 meters. 360. Okay, 55 minutes to get as close as we can to waypoint two. We're coming off bottom a little bit earlier than normal. Uh, those of you who are listening a little while ago, uh, because we've got a set of midwater transects. So we can uh, that we put in a ship. It's going to be a similar right. type of protocol um, that we did what uh, a number of days ago. So I see something ahead at two. We're going to move five. up to 800 okay, meters we'll and do a series of um, waypoint two, right? Horizontal. Yeah, I got waypoint from from through the water column. Sirius. And well, stay tuned for yeah, that because you get two, all types of weird things two, completely two, different than what you're seeing down here. Two, two, Snaggle tooth teeth and okay. jellies and siphonophores and right. larvations and if you don't know what any of those animals are you can find out yep. if you stay tuned after this reviews. dive and see what's up in the water column above the seamount yeah your sonar looks good that there. will occur cool all right at, we're going to lift off so on somewhere around 330 a little after 330 and the transect begins at about you push out a little bit four o'clock so yeah and then but we they're all going to be watching as your OV rises to 225. Sounds great. So that's the plan. Okay, co pilot, once you're comfortable, I'll call it in. Not getting any ADCP figures right now. No, I think they have the ADCP off. Okay. A little chuckle in the event log right now. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. You can call him. Move it. Bridge, Harvey. Now. This and is bridge, uh, thought she can hey, you guys ready for a move? to yes, a sir. midwater crater. All right. Let's go person, three zero no meters, bearing two two five degrees, speed zero decimal two knots. and black corals and bamboo. It's not going to happen, Amanda. Three zero Sorry. meters range, two two five degrees. Perfect. I'm ready into it. I told the last expedition. I'm not going to give them up, but I can <laughs> very impress with them. I do love them. They are just amazing to see and uh, talk about. Crazy morphology. Yes. That was really fun to have you involved in that, Scott. So, hey, we've got Degal Lindsay on from Jamstech. He's one of the uh, school of midwater biologists, as I think Scott had <laughs> jokingly described them. And he said uh, that he's thinking of doing the first transect at 900 meters rather than 800 meters because he's been looking at the uh, oxygen data there, I think. So he's putting that out to the other midwaterists out there who are going to be participating on this dive to see whether they are, whether they want to go ahead and change the protocol slightly. Coming up on some possibly a anemone or something. A single polyp sclerotinian, I'll bet. Single polyp coral. Hey, you're tugging me. There might be something. Yeah, dead. Go ahead, video. Spongery. Um, yes, we're having a bit of side conversation here on uh, adjusting our midwater transect depths a bit. Smart. We will definitely do the first one at 900 meters, so you can help that along to the pilots and everybody. And then we're just uh, a little more we'll, we'll solidify what the rest of them are, hopefully in the next few minutes here. 
And we could also uh, take a quick look, look up in the upper right-hand awesome. corner at the uh, brittle star when you have a chance. This is a cup coral. This is the same group of animals as the corals you find in tropical shallow waters. But this is a single individual grown with